Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 129, Feminism. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my independent and extremely capable co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm doing good. So this is your first weekend in quite some time without having marching band activities. Yay. Um... What's it like having your weekends back? Um, well, it's nice that I actually have time to relax. <laughs> and, you know, I actually do chores now, so. That is definitely nice. We're glad that you do, do, you do chores now as well. Uh, but that is not what we're talking about today. Today we are talking about feminism. Now, this was a topic that you would come up with. And when we came up with the concept of this, we had originally planned on finding a subject matter expert to come in and do this. Unfortunately, we kind of got uh, caught up on timing and, and lining up guests and stuff like that. So instead of doing this with a subject matter expert, I thought it would be best to get your take on feminism and your thoughts on it and, you know, use the research that you had to kind of drive the discussion. Uh, you know, just a caveat here, total disclosure here. I'm not a woman, so I don't pretend to fully grasp all the concepts of feminism. Uh, however, I will say that I am much more aware of it now and much more appreciative of it now and of the treatment of, of women in general. Thanks largely because of you. Um, I found I am much more sympathetic to the issues that women face now because I don't want you to have to face a lot of these issues that are traditionally out there. I don't want you to face the boundaries. I don't want someone telling you, you can't be what you want. You can't earn the money that you deserve. Um, so I'm far more empowered, I think, now in my knowledge of, of feminist issues. Um, and I'm far more supportive of feminist type movements to, to help young women like you so that you don't have to face that kind of oppression moving forward in life. So we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about feminism. We'll take a look at what feminism today is. And what it's been over its more than 170 years of history. We'll explore the four waves of feminism and talk about the advances each has brought and their differences. And then we'll explore some, some of the problems uh, with modern feminism before we finish up with suggestions on ways to promote feminism. Before we do that, though, I do want to invite our audio, uh, our listening and our viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast, audio versions of this podcast can be found listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. And we're pretty much anywhere you can get a podcast. Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Uh, we would also encourage our listeners and viewers to write in to us. Give us your feedback. Give us your so show suggestions. Tell us how we can improve things. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. You can get us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. 
or you can reach out to us through our official website at www.insightsintothings.com. Are we ready? Yep. All right, let's get this going. So understanding feminism. So so like we normally do in our podcast, we'll take the segments that we have, we'll split them up into different segments, uh, different sections, and then we'll each kind of deal with different sections. So I thought understanding feminism would be a very safe one for me because it's very important that I do understand it. So this comes to us from humanrightscareers.com. Feminism is one of the oldest movements in history. And while there is no single definition for it, feminism boils down to ending gender discrimination and creating gender equality. There are many types of feminism, but instead of isolating all of them, feminism can be divided into waves. This is one of the most common metaphors to describe feminism and explain its movements. However, this system does have flaws pertaining to the oversimplifying a complicated history of values ideas, and people in conflict with each other. With this simplification, people can believe that feminism's history was straightforward, but it was really a lot messier. There are many sub-movements that build on and fought with each other. The wave metaphor doesn't tell the whole story, but it's a good start. So why don't you start us with the four waves? So the f- So first up we have the first wave. So this wave takes place in the 19th century. While it wasn't the first appearance of feministic feministic ideals, it represents the first real political movement for the Western world. In 1848, um, inspired by Mary Wollstonecraft's book entitled Vindication of the Rights of Women, published in 1792, About 200 women met at a church and picked 12 resolutions asking for for specific rights, like the right to vote. After years of feminist activism, Congress finally passed the 19th Amendment in 1920 that gave women the right to vote. This was almost 30 years after New Zealand became the first country where women could vote. First wave feminism had one simple goal— to have society recognize that women are humans, not property. Unfortunately, this wave of feminism was focused on white women's rights, which would later haunt newer versions of feminism. So, first wave feminism started, you know, if we mark it with the start of the release of the book in 1792, it didn't really start to see any of its uh, uh, efforts start to bear fruit until 1920, that's an awful long time to have a movement with, with very little going on. Yeah, that's like almost 200 years at that point. Yeah, you're looking at a very long time. And obviously New Zealand was, was ahead of us on that one. But the one point that they do make here is that they're talking about white women's rights. And nowadays, that's given today's society, that's, that's a very significant statement to make but at the time it the the way society was was shaped i guess i could say uh it was not uncommon um because you know everyone all women had rights issues um but you figure back in 1792 slavery was still legal in the united states so when that movement started you weren't seeing anybody fight really at it all for slaves' rights. You may have had some abolitionist movements start up there to at least look for slaves' uh, uh, freedoms, but to to actually fight for equal rights was was unheard of until really until the 20th century. Uh, you had some of that in the 1800s after the Civil War, but but real civil rights and equal rights for African American women is still a struggle to this day. So the second wave, second wave feminism, took place in the 1960s and 70s. It built on first wave feminism and challenged what a woman's role in society should be. The activists focused on the institutions that held women back. 
This meant taking a closer look at why women were oppressed, traditional gender and family rules were questioned, and the queer theory became more established. There were, more vic- uh, there were major victories in this area, including the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and various Supreme Court cases. This wave created three main types of feminism, which include mainstream or liberal, radical, and cultural. Mainstream feminism focused on institutional reforms, which meant reducing gender discrimination, giving women access to male-dominated spaces, and promoting equality. Radical feminism wanted to reshape society entirely, stating the system was inherently meant as a male-dominating and ruling system, and that only an overhaul would bring liberation. It resisted the belief that men and women were basically the same. Cultural feminism had a similar view and thought that there is a female essence that is distinct from men. What are your thoughts on second wave feminism? Did you have any insights or thoughts on it? Well, I definitely think um, it was a pretty important step because not only was it hoping for women to get similar rights as men, but now they're starting to get into more male-dominated spaces and thus people start to realize that, you know, they're able to do similar things to men. So it was a pretty big step. Um, in the long run, for feminism in general. Yeah, and you know, they talk about the Equal Pay Act of 1963. That was helpful, but it was not problem-solving, because even today you still have a pay gap between men and women that we struggle to, to resolve. Yeah. Um, and we've got laws on the books that say you're not allowed to do that, but it, society still pushes unequal standards like that. Mm -hmm. What was third wave? So, thanks to the victories of second wave feminism, women enjoyed more rights and power going into the 1990s. They were able to think about other aspects of their identity, welcoming individuality and rebellion. This was an era of reclaiming. Many women felt Many women more freely expressed their sexuality in how they in how they spoke, dressed, dressed, and acted. This sometimes bewildered second-wave feminists, many of whom had resisted traditional femininity. While while many ideas and mini-movements swirled around this time, the one rule was that there weren't rules. A woman could choose how she lived her life. Third-wave feminists also became more conscious of race. Don't know why I was going to say conscientious. I don't know why. While mainstream first- and second-wave feminists had largely ignored or neglected racial disparities within gender, the third wave paid more attention. When the internet became more commonplace, it was even easier to hear perspectives and ideas from feminists around the world. Feminism was expanding. So that's a very good point. So third-wave feminism, kind of, you're in, you were in the third wave third wave feminism do you consider yourself feminist um well i definitely do wish for equal rights for all genders um although i'm definitely not like as vocal with it as i think most people are um i definitely do have strong opinions about various about this kind of stuff and how i do want us to kind of and how i do kind of want to see eventually total gender equality for everyone. And I I do as well. And like I said at the start of the show, I don't want you to have to face the inability to do something or be something that you want just because of your gender. Um, Gender discrimination is, is, to me, it's very similar to, to racial discrimination. And it's the fact that there are differences, you know, there's differences in, in race, there's differences in culture and religion, and there's differences in gender. For us to stigmatize or um, to discriminate against someone because they're different than we are is really a, a flawed philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, this country was built on 
diversity. And that diversity is what made us stronger. You celebrate that diversity. You, you don't ostracize it. You don't push it to the side. And nobody gains from that. Yeah. Having that diversity of cultures and, and influence makes it the society a better place. It's just a shame that, that it's taking so long to get to that point. Yeah. So that brings us to fourth wave feminism. Some believe we're still in third wave of feminism since this wave isn't much of a shift from the thir third one. However, with the Me Too movement and the number of attacks on women's rights, many believe we're in a new wave. Social media activism has propelled the movement firmly into the technological age. It builds on the third wave's emphasis on inclusivity and asks hard questions about what empowerment, equality, and freedom really mean. Fourth wave feminism continues to reckon with intersectionality. Critics of, quote, white feminism, which ignores the unique struggles of women of color, expose how non-white feminists and ideas have been and continue to be suppressed. Trans rights are a big part of this conversation, too. Feminism has often been an unwelcoming and hostile place for trans women and others who rejected the gender binary. Many fourth-wave feminists are working to combat this exclusion. As with every wave before, and probably after it, the fourth wave is complex. It encompasses many movements that both complement and clash with each other. The tension is unavoidable. While some types of feminism can have harmful impacts, having a, having a variety of voices makes feminism more inclusive and successful. Let me ask you, and, and we've done a podcast on, you know, uh, gender equality in the past. Where do you think gender equality as far as the trans community fits into feminism? I feel that now the people are starting to look more at the fact that feminism isn't really just about getting white rights for women, but rights for all genders. Because, like, a lot of the time, trans people are really having struggles with getting rights. And um, just look at the fact of how, like, schools aren't allowing various trans kids to compete in sports of the gender they wish to be a son they wish to be uh known as because they're supposed to be in the ones where they were and they were supposed to be in the sports where the gender which gen where the gender was assigned to them they're biologically assigned gender yeah yeah and like even the fact that you have to keep women and men separate in sports for um school is also kind of something that a lot of people have been discussing and that's probably one of, if we actually do and are able to solve that that would probably also help with trans people but like we're really facing a pretty major issue with that and i definitely think that people who that now we should really be including other genders as opposed to just females and just basically make it so that all genders have the same equality. So there was one particular uh, event, I suppose, that kind of hit home on this one. And, and you and Mama used to go to a annual retreat called uh, Where Women Gather. Mm -hmm. And you'd go away for uh, four or five days or so and do all kinds of different activities. And it was it was really a, a, a feminist type of em empowerment and support type of uh, environment to be in. And it exploded with some uh, controversy when there was some concern about including trans women with that program as well. Because it, it was a women only retreat and there was a decision that was made that excluded, quite forcefully excluded, trans women from the retreat moving forward. How did that make you feel? Cause I know, I know uh, mommy stopped going and a lot of, a lot of supporters stopped going to the event after that, but how did that personally make you feel? You were kind of young at the time, but I'm curious what your impression was with that. Well, I definitely realized. So 
when I was young, I really didn't know much about trans people or trans women in general. I didn't really know a lot about the movement, and I really didn't know much about the community in general. But when I started hearing it more, I kind of realized that, yeah, the retreat was kind of making some mistakes, because I know one of the people we had met with was a trans woman, and they weren't going to be able to go to where women gather because, you know, trans women. So I definitely realized that... I definitely felt that Where Women Gather was supposed to be an inclusive place where, like, all of us were able to work together and just be just a community on our own. And when I realized it was kind of rejecting certain people from the community, it kind of made me, like, really not want to go there anymore. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, it was it was definitely something that I think uh, I think you and mommy enjoyed and, and benefited from, and I think a lot of people benefited from it. And to sort of take that support system away because of uh, an inability to understand and integrate the diversity again, it's discrimination, no matter how you look at it. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back and. We're going to talk about the problems with modern feminism, and hopefully I won't get too much hate mail by talking about that as a man. So we'll, we'll be right back. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. Today we're talking about feminism. So let's talk about the problems with modern feminism. I didn't write these myself. These come from an article on medium.com. Today, feminism is known as a very touchy subject. If someone asks you if you're a feminist, regardless of your gender, there seems to be no right answer. The subject can cause conflicts among people in its recent controversies. Let's talk about some of the modern problems with feminism nowadays and the various controversies surrounding it. So what's our first one? So the first one might be a little hard for me to pronounce, but I'll try my best. Feminism is against femininity. That was pretty good. Thanks. Better than I did. <laughs> good thing we switched. Yeah. So it's somewhat ironic how so many feminists are against all things associated with the term feminine. This is mainly about how these feminists shame other women for making career, clothing, or other choices to something that was traditionally feminine. The thing is, the thing is that you can make a feminine... Yeah. Uh, Couldn't last the whole time, huh? (laughs) I'm trying. This is a hard segment to read. The thing is that you can be a feminist and acknowledge that femininity and masculinity, which is much easier to say, apparently... (laughs) Uh, exist as concepts and not as exact science. It is hard to campaign for female power and femininity when feminists turn against the same traits and interests that were belittled by men long ago. We could risk going full circle and creating the slippery slope that feminists of the past tried to eradicate. So what are your thoughts on this? I know you're not a very... And I'm going to get hate mail for this, I'm sure. But you're not a very frou-frou. You know, you don't wear pink a lot. You don't, you know, you don't wear what, what, and I'll, and I'll just 
blame society here. You don't wear what society, modern society, refers to as overly feminine uh, apparel. You don't wear a lot of skirts or dresses or anything like that. You don't really like that sort of stuff. You're not comfortable in it. What are your thoughts on on women who do do that? And what are your thoughts on women who don't do that? I honestly, I'm perfectly fine with anyone who does. Like, I don't, like, immediately look at some, a female who is wearing a skirt and go like, oh, that's, ugh. I don't do that. I'm not that kind of person. And, like, um, and I know that there's a term that, like, is basically a stereotype, which would consider me a tomboy, which mommy doesn't really like to use that term on me because really it shouldn't really be a term. It's more of a stereotype rather than what describing my fashion sense, really. Um, sure, and I think I'm with mommy on that, is that I don't like labels in general uh, because labels tend to pigeonhole you into you trying to be what that label is, even subconsciously. Um, but your own ability to wear what you want, dress how you want. Let me let me just ask you, why do you not dress girly, we'll say? And I know I'll get hate mail for that one. <laughs> it's fine. I don't dress in what society would consider girls typically dress in, mainly because I don't really find it comfortable. I always find that dresses just feel weird to me. I don't like dressing like, Fancy. I don't typically like having my hair down or having it done in any fancy way. As you can tell, it's really not all that fancy. I really just tie it back, and that's kind of it. Um, I don't wear skirts because I never really like... I kind of like the fact of feeling shorts or pants. I don't really like the feeling of skirts or dresses um, because... I kind of prefer shorts and pants over just feeling like it's a bit more loose than that. Um... Hoodies. I think I think they're very comfortable. I find like extreme comfort in hoodies, and um, so you're not trying to make some kind of societal statement or or statement against feminism by dressing the way you do. You dress the way you do because it's comfortable. Yeah, and like I don't have and I don't have any grudge against women who want to dress in what society thinks that p women should dress in. Right. Um, like, I don't think that clothing should really kind of define our gender or anything like that. The good thing is people have kind of started to accept the fact that women start wearing this kind of stuff. And thing is, I don't want people to start shaming women for wearing traditional feminine clothing. And, like, I also don't want it to be, like... Just having the traditional role in general, like just wanting to be a simple housewife. I don't think shaming that would be good at all. And I think if we really do want to have gender equality, we're giving them the option. And if they want to be what was traditionally feminine, they should. They should right. have that option. But like, they shouldn't just have that. They should have other options. That's kind of what I'm trying to get across with this. I'm with you. Choice and non-judgmental consequences. I'm totally with you there. You should be able to choose what you want, and nobody should judge you for it. Yeah. Whatever, However you want to live your life. As long as you're not hurting somebody else, you're fine. Yeah. You know, I'll be the first one to tell you that my number one philosophy when it comes to getting dressed in the morning is what's comfortable. Hence why I wear Hawaiian shirts all the time. Um, I, I worked at a job where I had to wear a suit and tie for a very long time and did not like doing that. And I don't do that anymore. You know, it's, it's, you find the things that you do not do well and do not do them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the next thing that we have is gender neutral feminism. Because nowadays, people identify as something other than male or female, a gender-neutral term should represent the inclusivity and intentions of this movement to banish gender inequalities in all forms affecting all people. Many people see feminism as more woman-led and female-promoting movement. Any men a part of this movement are more so known as allies rather than actual members. This is harmful and suggests that there isn't, it isn't their fight too when it really is. 
feminism is for everyone, despite what its name suggests. It's banned that this belief is thought to only encapsulate the injustices of women when other gender injustices should be included. Now, and I have to say, I'm guilty of this myself for the longest time. I didn't feel I was qualified to consider myself a member of the feminist movement itself because I wasn't female. Um, and, and kind of being a male puts me on the outside a little bit because there are certain things that I'll never understand that women have to go through. I'll, I'll never uh, comprehend some of the difficulties. I'll certainly never understand the uh, consequences of the injustices. I just, you know, I can read about them, I can hear about them, and I can sympathize with them. But it's the same thing with racial injustice. I can sympathize with Black Lives Matter and I can get angry at the injustice and the discrimination. But because I'm a white man, I can never really fully appreciate, you know, the feeling that a black man getting pulled over on the side of the street by a police officer, that anxiety that they feel because of society. I'll never feel the the hurt or the damage of working in a company knowing that no matter how good I do my job, because I'm a certain gender, I'm never going to make the same amount as the opposite gender that does the same job as me, the same level that I do. I'll never experience that. And I'm of the mindset that it's difficult to be fully invested in something if you can't experience the entire gambit of what's there. So I consider myself firmly in the allies category because of that. Mm. And it, I don't think that diminishes my support for wanting you to be equal. You know, I get very angry when mommy comes home and tells me the things that happened to her that deep down inside, I think they happened to her because she's a female. Not because of any competence issue, because mommy is highly competent, probably the most competent person that can do what she does at her job. Um, and I think she gets mistreated a lot of times there because it's a male-run company. And it, it, there's gender bias that happens everywhere. And, and a lot of times that gender bias is not intentional. It, and people don't set out to be biased against women. But it's been so ingrained in society for so long that people just do it by default. Um, so for me, it, it angers me to see stuff like that. But I can't be a feminist because I can't experience it myself and, and understand it. You know what I you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. What are your thoughts on that? How do you feel about men that contribute to the feminist movement? I do feel men that it's important for men to also contribute to this because we're going to make larger differences when men also realize this and realize the injustices done with gender equality and how we need to move forward with it. And I definitely think gaining men's support would definitely help move the movement along. I agree 100%. I agree. What's, uh, what's next up? Next up, we have Just a Woman's Fight. Despite the progress the United States has made over the decades, no one country has 100% gender equality. Back then, the task was to elevate women's rights at the most basic level. Nowadays, while the world is still a long way, ha still has a long way to go to reach full gender equality, this movement should expand to the full range of gender discrimination in issues with the modern world. From toxic masculinity to the unfair bias against fathers when it comes to child custody battles. The idea that women are the ideal caregivers and not men hurts everyone. Just because the norm is that men are more privileged than women doesn't mean we should ignore the very real issues that men also face. While many women want to step away from the roles assigned to them in the past, like the home giver, men are starting to wish to take up some of those roles for themselves. All genders should be allowed to determine what they want their role to be without judgment. 
Now, this is an interesting one here because this is really a very modernist uh, idea of things where men and women are swapping those home roles, I should say. Um, you think of of what it meant to be uh, a homemaker, all right? So my, my go back to my parents. My parents had a very 1950s mentality. My father went off to work. My mother stayed home and took care of the house. She cooked. She cleaned. She made sure the bills were paid and everything was running. And, and really, she ran the household. My father never gave her any credit for that, though. And the amount of effort that she put into it was astonishing. My father, my father thought he did all the work because he was a common laborer. He'd go off to work five days a week and he'd unload tractor trailers, which was hard work. You know, I did it myself for a little while. It's, it's hard work to do. And he did it for in like 40 years, but he never really appreciated the effort that was required to make sure there was a meal on the table every day when he got home or to make sure that there was food in the refrigerator when you wanted something or that the bills were paid and that the, the utilities weren't getting shut off and that the house was clean and that the laundry was getting done. And what he failed to appreciate, which I saw, cause I, I helped my mom, you know, a lot during those years was that he would go out and work an eight hour day and come home and be done. And the homemaker doesn't work a convenient eight hour day. They're always on the clock, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not, they don't get weekends off. And it, it gave me an appreciation for the efforts that were required. And I'm guilty of probably not being as participatory in, in a lot of those things as I probably should be. Uh, but it doesn't mean I don't appreciate the efforts that's involved. And I think part of the problem, part of the not problem, but part of the irony of today is some of the men today are moving into some of these more, you know, what were traditionally women's roles. And they're finally starting to get an appreciation for what's involved. You know, my father was never exposed to having to do laundry. There was one brief period of time that he had to change diapers for his granddaughter and he totally panicked and couldn't, couldn't manage it because he never did anything like that. Um, there was nothing domesticated at all about my father. Mm -hmm. And he didn't appreciate that until much later in life when, you know, he was on his deathbed and he saw everything that was involved in that because he couldn't go off to work anymore. He was home, he was sick, he was on disability, and he saw everything that my mother did to, to care for him and to keep the house running. And sadly, it took that long for him to really appreciate what she did. Um, so in today's society, seeing that, that gender switch is it, really a good thing, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely think it's good that men are really starting to appreciate, like, how much women really played a part in making sure that they were, you know, ready. And it's nice to see how men are actually starting to take on that role for themselves and are kind of starting to break their gender biases because men also have pretty hardcore gender biases. I know that there's, like, this whole mentality that, like, this generation of men is weak, and really they're not. Like... Just because they're actually starting to feel things and be less focused on what was traditionally masculine, I honestly think they're getting a lot stronger, like a lot emotionally stronger, not just like physically, but like they're getting a lot more emotionally stronger. They're starting to open up more and they're starting to learn the struggles that women originally went through and are starting to kind of go through it themselves and realize that they did a lot, and they're starting to really find appreciation for it. Very good point. The one thing that I, I do think is worth mentioning, and, and that's the fact that there are, obviously, there are physical differences, and there are intellectual differences between men and women. And I don't mean that as a negative. Yeah. In fact, if anything, I, I mean that more as a positive for women, you know, to think of a man going through childbirth is 
I, I can't have a cold without whining like a little baby. I could never imagine myself going through childbirth. And, I, you know, women from a, a mental standpoint, their ability to multitask, and that's one thing I give my mother credit for, she could mentally juggle 12 things at once, keep everything in the air at the same time, and still give attention to her kids and make sure that everything was, was running smoothly in the house. And men just can't do that. Um, and, and you go beyond that to literally physical uh, differences that, that are advantages that women have. You know, you look at, at uh, scientifically, one of the documentaries that I had watched was on the, the Mercury women the women who actually trained to be astronauts and how they were able to handle some of the tests that, that the men who went into space had to face. They did the same exact test. One of them was, was a, an isolation chamber and they were trying to simulate what it would be like floating in a capsule in space for hours by yourself. And the men, they lasted maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes or something like that. And the women could last for hours in there. Um, so it's just, it shows a different, way of thinking a different mentality and how we don't you shouldn't discriminate against those things those are the things that you celebrate those are the things that make us better as a society um and this is this is one of those things where men are starting to appreciate what these traits that were traditionally female led positions require and the struggles and, and when you have that appreciation, it makes you much more sympathetic to, to gender equality. The last one that we have here is body-based feminism. And this is kind of more of a, more of an afterthought. And they kind of put it into perspective. They say this new breed of feminism revolves around first world problems like body hair and the inclusion of obese models in fitness magazines and neglect some of the world's most horrific ongoing gender-based violence, such as forced marriage and much more brutal problems. While these issues do matter, we need to be mindful that other people are facing different battles. So it, it, these are definitely issues that need to be acknowledged, but they're definitely not top-of-the-line um, world-impacting problems that we probably need to focus on. Uh, that was it for this segment. We're going to take our last break. We'll come back and then you'll tell us ways to promote good feminism. Insights into entertainment, a podcast series, taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights in the Teens. Today we're talking about feminism, and now we're going to talk about ways to promote good feminism. And I'm going to try my best to uh, put this source. Never mind. Yeah, don't worry about that, because we never were able to pronounce that. Yeah, uh, we'll just... We'll keep... put it in the show notes. Yeah, well, it's in the show notes. So, first up, we have make use of social print and electronic media. Highlight the issue at hand and help your teen understand it better by writing blogs, sharing articles, or perhaps create live videos with meaningful messages. But don't just stop at that. Social media is a very important tool with an impact far more outreaching than we, could, than we, than we can ever imagine. Challenge and counteract media 
that intentionally or unintentionally undermines women's rights. Make sure your voice is heard by raising your concern and registering your complaints where they are appropriate. We also have call out any call out inequality. Even small acts of resistance can make a difference. Sometimes people do not realize what what's wrong until someone points it out. So don't hesitate to point out and raise awareness in suitable ways. Support nonprofit organizations working for women. There's a plethora of organizations that are tirelessly working hard to defend women's rights. Many women have fought to give us what we today enjoy as basic rights. By we, I mean women, obviously. Women are more empowered, confident, and bold than they ever were. However, many parts of the world, in many parts of the world, women are still being abused, deprived of education, and much worse. Attacks and other horrible acts are done to hundreds of women around the world, and they need support. Recent women's marches around the world clearly evidenced what we are capable of when we organize and mobilize. Elicit support from men. Hashtag he for she was launched in September 2014 as a movement that aims to inspire and encourage men to take action against gender inequality. While gender equality discussions are mostly surrounding women, to truly gain full equality for women, don't dismiss support and help from men. Encourage them to step up and play their part in the movement. And finally, we have mentor goals and raise their aspirations. Eh, no. I said goals, not girls. My apologies. The last, last up, we have mentor girls and raise their aspirations. It is important to support and empower young girls nowadays. When you empower young girls, you are raising the quality of life for everyone. It is these very, it's these very girls that will lead children by example, lead businesses, lead communities, and even lead the country one day. By mentoring and, by mentoring and raising their aspirations, we're laying the ground for a future generation of women who have the power to crush stereotypes and rise above all challenges. Even little actions count and can potentially make a huge difference. Your one step forward could possibly inspire several others to do the same. The one other thing that I would add to that that we don't have uh, in the script here, and that's give credit to the women that are leading by example. For good example, your, uh, your one teacher at school, um, you had an experience with a substitute teacher in her class and that substitute teacher had made, again, one of those disparaging remarks that society normally would simply ignore and move on, but it was a gender disparaging comment that was, um, and I don't want to get into specifics, but it was basically don't do something that way uh, as a girl because girls can't do it as good. It was, it was basically that was the gist of it. And, and it, it bothered you, and it should. It should bother all of us when somebody says and does something like that. And you came home and we talked about it. We had suggested you know, letting your teacher know because she seemed like she was the type of person who would be supportive of, of you in trying to make a difference. And tell us, give us that story. Give us the details of that story. Um, so I was going to mention this at some point, um, but in my engineering and my physics class um, for the academy, um, I will say it's not very female dominated. In fact, there's only one other female besides me in the class. So yeah, it's kind of one of those things where it's kind of mainly male dominated, but for the most part, I was never really discriminated for it. This was the few, this was the one exception. Uh, because the other female, Melody, um, was in the library, I was... Names have been changed to protect the innocent. Yes. <laughs> um, I was basically the only female in the room, and when he did say this remark, I kind of felt uncomfortable, um, just because I was the only female in the room. So what did he say? Basically, um, he was talking to some of the other, uh, guys in my class, kind of like... 
going about the whole, oh, this gen- kind of a similar thing to the, this generation of men is kind of weak, but he wasn't, really wasn't saying it specifically. It was kind of just like, I don't know what the boys were doing, but he was kind of mentioning how well, they're not like strong or something. And then he said, the exact comment is, I've seen girls that are stronger than you. And that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It was like, kind of just saying that like, one, it was about, you know, the whole talk about um, men aren't as strong as they used to be. And I kind of already mentioned that, but it also kind of undermined me because again, only female in the room kind of didn't really make me feel all that well. And it made me very uncomfortable because I know he wasn't doing anything inherently wrong, and the good thing was, it wasn't directed directly towards me, but the comments still didn't really sit right with me. So, basically, um, at some- I don't know if it- I'm th- I'm guessing it was the next time I saw my teacher, um, we would t- um, I basically went into a separate area with her and, uh, told her about the incident, and the good thing was- she was actually extremely supportive, and being a female in the science field, she actually experienced very similar a very similar feeling, and thus had a very strong opinion toward it. And the good thing was, um, she definitely helped to make action to it. She notified the principal, I met with him and told him about the incident, and he was also very supportive about it, and it was really nice. And it ended up with uh, my science teacher actually allowing me to go with Melody to the library if I ever did happen to have that same substitute. So I guess my moral of the story here is that when these things happen, and they will continue to happen until, really, until humans evolve beyond the, the point of gender discrimination, and I don't know when that's going to be, but when they do happen, you have to have the courage to stand up for what's right. You have to have the courage to, to say, look, that's not right, that's wrong, that's the wrong attitude, that's exclusionary, that's discriminating, that's insulting. And you have to have people like your science teacher who are there to, to support you. you. You can't be expected to do it all on your own. And the fact that you have people at your school that are willing to provide that level of support is very encouraging. So... When you see this happen, so if you see an injustice, do something about it. But when you see others that support you and have your back and and help you to try to overcome those, give those people credit. They deserve the credit for being revolutionary enough and brave enough to stand up for the right thing. And you deserve credit for having the courage to say something. Because, yes, there's only two uh, females that are in the class, but I doubt that's the only class that this particular individual has exposure to. So by, by standing up for yourself, you are directly standing up for every other female in the school that this person is going to come across and other people might not have that level of courage. So you made a difference and I think you deserve a pat on the back for that. Thank you. Uh, anything else before we go? I think that was all we had uh, material-wise. Um, I think we seem pretty good. Okay. Well, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll get your closing thoughts, and then we'll finish up the business of the podcast. Go for your closing thoughts. All righty. So to everyone out there, I just wanted to say that I believe feminism doesn't just include women, it includes every other gender, and just the fact that we are still trying to reach gender equality. And while we definitely have a long ways to go, we are definitely making progress. And I just want to say, I want to support anyone that is going to stand up against any form of injustice, whether that be for gender, race, religion, etc., Just know that speaking out against any kind of injustice will definitely have a positive impact going forward. And I definitely want people to support total gender equality. And I don't want people to be 
in the community to be against each other or against original ideas because all genders should have equal rights and should be able to choose how they live. Very well said. I could not agree with you more. You. I think this went well. Um, I, I think we presented it in a way that should minimize the hate mail that I get for this now. <laughs> <laughs> Before we do go, I want to once again invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, pretty much any place you can get a podcast. I would also invite you to write into us, give us your feedback. Uh, we'd love to get show suggestions and uh, some idea of what you want us to talk about, what you want us not to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, you can get us at instagram.com slash insights into things. We can get links to that and much more on our official website at www.insightsintothings.com and you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. Well done. That's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.